I'm going to be singing Silent Night, and I'm going to sing the first verse again, but in Italian. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, round young virgin mother and child, holy infant so tender and mild, Sleep in heavenly peace, sleep in heavenly peace. Astro Deche, Poco Divine, Mitonia, Loriento, Tu che vari de longi sonia. Tu che angelici voci non dia, lustania genti, e pacia in fondi ne cor. The prophets said to all who had been made captive, call upon the Lord, for he has plans to prosper you and give you peace and hope. So the people waited and watched. They prayed for a miracle. Time passed and the days became years. They were dark and very long. The people cried, O Messiah, where are you? Where is the promised warrior, the conqueror, our savior, our king? When will he come who shall slay our enemies and lead us to the promised land? We long for a miracle. Come to us, O God of hope. And still there was silence and darkness as the people of Israel waited. Generation followed generation as the people of God languished and waited ruled by darkness and evil. Finally, in the fullness of time, there was in the city of Nazareth a virgin named Mary who was betrothed to Joseph. An angel of the Lord appeared to Mary and said, Be not afraid. Rejoice, for the Lord has found favor in you. The Holy Spirit shall come upon you, and you shall bear a son, and his name shall be called Jesus. Mary was at first afraid of the meaning of Gabriel's vo words, but then she answered, let it be to me according to your word. My soul magnifies the Lord and I am not afraid. Joseph was also visited by an angel of the Lord and heard the assurance that this was indeed God's plan. So he took Mary as his wife and held her in his heart. He too said, I trust in the Lord, and I am not afraid. Thus it was that when Mary was great with child, she and Joseph traveled to Bethlehem to be counted in a census as ordered by the Roman emperor. While there, Mary gave birth to a son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, as there was no room for them at the inn. It became clear to all who saw him that this tiny sleeping child was the Son of God, the Savior, the promised King. This child was God's messenger of love, peace, and hope to the cold and silent earth. There in the humblest of places, surrounded by simple shepherds and lowly creatures, Mary took the baby Jesus in her tender arms and whispered, a miracle is born this holy night. A miracle is born this holy night.
Sean, is it on? Okay, it is. What child is this who lay to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping? Whom angels greet with anthems sweet while shepherds watch are keeping? This, this is Christ the King whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him, Lord, the babe, the son of Mary. Why lies he in such mean a state where rocks and ass are feeding? Good Christian, fear for sinners here, the silent word is pleading. This, this is Christ the King. Whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him, Lord, the babe, the son of Mary. So bring him in sense gold and myrrh, come peasant king to own him. The king of kings salvation brings, let loving hearts enthrone him. This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him, Lord, the babe, the son of Mary. And so it had come to pass that on this holiest of nights, this night of miracles, Christ the Savior was born. The heavens rang with angelic sounds and the light of the power and glory of God shone all around. The angels sang, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace and goodwill to all. Christ is born. Christ is born, sing glory to God. Word of Jesus' birth quickly spread and the people praised God for all that was told to them. Angels had brought good tidings of great joy to those waiting in darkness. Those who had persevered with faith in their hearts and believed in the promise were touched by God's gracious love. People everywhere fell to their knees, praising God and saying, I have heard his word and I trust in the Lord. I have heard the truth. I have been touched by God and I believe. It all began that sing single miraculous holy night over 2,000 years ago in the little town of Bethlehem. It began with a promise a promise made to a people that one day they would be saved. Instead of being saved by a fierce warrior leading a strong army, they and we were saved by a tiny child, 
a child of miracles, a child of everlasting light. Through faith in Jesus, our fears are placed upon his shoulders and he grants us his peace. Through, him and, through faith in him, he takes away our sins and gives us his love. This child of God's promise, this child is God's promise fulfilled. Through faith in him, we receive one of God's greatest miracles, the gift of hope. winter night in Bethlehem. Here within a lowly stall, he has come to save us all. This child who is born tonight in Bethlehem. star shines down tonight on Bethlehem. One little star shines down so clear and bright on Bethlehem. As it guides us on our way, he lies sleeping in the hay. This child who is born tonight in Bethlehem. Glory, hallelujah, fills the air. We can hear it ringing everywhere as the heavens above resound with joy. Glory, hallelujah, angels sing. We can hear the wondrous news they bring as they tell of the newborn baby boy. All of the world is here tonight in Bethlehem. All of the world is here to find the light in Bethlehem. He has come from God above. He will fill our hearts with love. This child who is born tonight in Bethlehem. A child is born tonight in Bethlehem. Good morning, happy Sabbath. 
Please open your Bible to Luke, Luke 2, verses 6 to 7. Luke 2, 6 and 7. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in the manger because there was no room for them in the inn. <laughs> no problem. Well, happy Sabbath. Just a couple of announcements before I get started this morning. Um, we do have our game night tonight, Vespers and game night at 6.30 this evening. Uh, tonight we have games for the kids and also uh, Bible Jeopardy. Well, actually it's Christmas Jeopardy, gals versus guys. So if you can be out for that, we're going to have some fun, popcorn, of course, drinks, and good time to fellowship with one another. And bring a snack if you'd like to also. So with that, let's go ahead and have a prayer and we'll get right into the word this morning. Father in heaven, just want to thank you for the opportunity to be here to worship this morning. Thank you for this holiday season. Thank you for all those minds and hearts that are thinking about Christmas and for that time when you came to this world, Lord, that you set aside all of that glory, all of that omnipotence and power that was yours, all your omniscience also, to become a child, to be born into this world, for our sake and for our salvation. Lord, help us as we grasp to understand the meaning behind that. Help our hearts and minds to be moved, to want to serve you better, to be righteous in your eyes. If we pray it in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. There's a sign right on Fenton Road. As you head south, some of you know who, uh, who Glenn Bernard is, kind of right past his old house there. Uh, it says, um, it says, it has a picture of Mary and then the star of Bethlehem. And then it says, this unplanned birth changed the world. Of course, I think it's a pro-life sign, you know, that talks about that. And partially it's true. Certainly Jesus' birth changed the world. Certainly it did. There's no denying that. However, the issue I take with the sign is that it was an unplanned birth unplanned pregnancy, I guess you could say. Huh? Unplanned by Mary, yes, thank you. However, to say that it was unplanned completely is not quite accurate. Jesus' birth is something that was planned from the very beginning of time. Since as soon as there was sin, there was a plan, there had to be a plan because this world found itself in a terrible state. This morning I want to consider the incarnation and what it meant, what it means for us, and how it applies to our life. Now we look in Luke chapter 2, if you're not already there, and certainly we see the fulfillment of Jesus being born. You know, Galatians also tells us that in the fullness of time, Jesus was brought forth. There is prophecy that helps us to understand and certainly helped the Magi and the wise men from the East to know when Jesus would be born. This was certainly a planned time. However, you know, if we knew, you know, just a, what was it, about a year and a half or two that there was going to be uh, Prince Charles, his baby was going to be born, and, and all the world was in, in this, you know, jubilant celebration of this child that was going to be born to Kate and to Charles, and they were, they were happy to have this, this kid born, but it was nothing like that when Jesus was born. As a matter of fact, he's born in a manger, in a manger that was partially a cave, that was underground, and this was probably 4 BC, um, right there in March, April, so kind of the coldish time of year still. How many of you have ever spent any time in a barn? You guys ever spent any time in a barn? Smells great, doesn't it? <laughs> it's, it's challenging sometimes to be in there with all the pungent stenches and stuff, and that's 
where Christ was born. You know, if we were able to choose where Christ would be born, we would want him born in a palace. We would want him surrounded with the finest doctors and nurses. We want Mary to be attended to, taken care of. We would want all the world, all the media to be focused on this one event because of what it means for our world. But that's just not what happened. That was just not the case when Christ was born. We read, so it was, verse 6, that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. So a very simple birth, uh, very trying circumstances to say the least. And I think this time of year, people like to focus on that particular aspect. But I would actually like to focus on the incarnation itself and what it means for us this morning. So if you turn with me forward in your New Testament Bible to Hebrews chapter 2. If you turn there with me. Hebrews chapter 2. And we're looking a little bit further down in Hebrews verses 14 and then also verse 17. I believe that when we consider the Incarnation, this will be the second greatest mystery that we'll study in heaven. The first being the cross of Christ. The second, I believe, being the Incarnation. Now look at verse 14 with me, and let's consider what happens here. Verse 14, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, and this is talking about Jesus, he himself likewise shared in the same. That through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Now, as you read through Hebrews chapter 2, one thing becomes very plain. That Jesus and God are the same. That they had the same power. That they have, they have the same omnipotence. They have the same thoughts. They, they are both God. There's no questioning or denying that. But we come to verse 14, and it's just a complete right-hand turn. Here is God becoming as man. And notice the words here about Jesus. He, right there in the middle, he himself likewise shared in the same. The Bible doesn't tell us that Jesus was just like man. It doesn't tell us that. But it does emphasize very plainly, he himself likewise shared in the same. Christ becomes a man. And here's a mystery. How do you have complete God and complete man joined together? How can the incarnation possibly be? It's something that boggles the mind. But here we have the last Adam described. Jesus coming as man. That birth in that manger is something that is just unfathomable. It's beyond comprehension. Yet, we know from scripture that it happens. Verse 17, just to underline this a little bit more. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. So, of course, this time of year we're focused on the birth of Jesus on this world. But now Jesus, of course, is our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. We believe that's where he is at, in that most holy place, ministering in our behalf and for the world. But we have a high priest who understands us in an intimate way. He knows our struggles. He knows where we're coming from. He had, according to verse 17, to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. Now, the incarnation does serve that purpose, that Jesus can relate to us. But there's something so much deeper here something so much more that we need to understand behind the meaning of the Incarnation, particularly as it affects our own lives. And I'd like you to turn back with me to Romans chapter 8. 
Romans chapter 8 and verses 1 through 4. Romans is a very dense um, gospel. Um, for those of you that perhaps haven't had the opportunity to go through Romans, Romans is a, is a gospel that, not a gospel, but a letter that Paul wrote to those in Rome because he was unable to get to them to share the gospel message that he wanted to. So in frustration, he's, he said, I've got to get this message to them. This is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to write it down. That's why Romans is so valuable to us. That's why it's such a dense book. That's why it can be difficult sometimes to understand. But we just want to focus a little bit on Romans 8, verses 1 through 4 this morning because it helps us to understand the meaning behind the incarnation, the meaning behind the joining of God and man in Christ. There is therefore, verse 1, now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. If we have Jesus in our lives, if we believe that Christ died for us, there is no condemnation in God's eyes. If we're walking according to the flesh and not according to the Spirit, verse 1. And now, verse 2, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now this can get a little bit confusing, but I want just to um, explain this briefly for you. There are two laws, two principles, if you will, that are going on in this text. You understand the principle of gravity, right? I throw something up, comes back down. I'm tempted to take something from the podium and throw it up and throw it down, but I'm not, I'm not going to do that, all right? The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Let's start with the principle that we are very familiar with. Each of us is finite. Each of us has an ending point, an expiration date, if you will. There is a chance, albeit very small, and I'm not wishing this on anyone, that we could be driving home from church today and our life could end. There's that possibility. We understand that that is possible. We know that there there is a law of sin and death. Because there is sin in this world, there is death. And that's something that we all are very aware. What we are not so keen about is what verse 2 describes as the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. This is a law that applies when we have awoken from spiritual death into life. This law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that abides with us. And Paul goes on to explain that for us as we move forward in verses 3 and 4. For what the law, now talking about the Ten Commandments, could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. So you understand, it's possible to know all the Bible. It's possible to have the Ten Commandments memorized. It's possible to understand all the nuances of what's right and what's wrong, but still fail utterly. You understand that, right? Because the law, the knowledge of the law, understanding what's right and wrong does not give you the ability to do right and wrong. It just doesn't have it happen. What the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. Now, this has been proven time and time again, particularly through our Jewish friends who put their stake in the law, in doing everything correct down to a T, down to the minutia of how one should act and behave and dress and look and say things and live and the customs that you have in life. That has been, down, has been done to a minutia in cultures where law has been tried to be obeyed to a point of just breaking the human spirit. It's true. The law could not change the flesh, though, and this is something we are very familiar with. We know what weakness in the flesh is. It's very possible to show up to church and to act all holy and pious and to act self-righteous and, and having everything presented just right, but we know what the weakness of the flesh is because every single one of us deals with it. Every single one of us has fallen to temptation. Every single one of us is sinners. There's no getting past that. It's because the law could not give us that ability to do what's right. But what the law could not do, Paul is telling us, God did 
by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And on account of sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. So you and I, all of us, have failure. Every single one of us has failure in life. That's just the reality of our existence. But what we could not do, the victory that we could not attain, had to be attained by Jesus. Amen. Now this is why the incarnation is so important to us. The joining of God with man. Because in and of ourselves we do not have the ability, the power, the stamina, the willpower, the, the gumption even, to do what's right. But what we could not do, Christ did. He condemned sin in the flesh. He had victory over sin in the flesh. And this is not just any flesh. This is your flesh. This is my flesh. This is the world that Christ took into himself. That's why this text starts off, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. If you accept what Christ did, you accept everything he did. Not just that you're going to go to heaven, but the victory that he has attained for you in the flesh. So verse 4, that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So what does it mean to have the Spirit of God in your life? It means to accept that victory that Jesus has won for you. It means to accept all that Christ has done for you. It means that sin is not more powerful than Jesus. There's no way. If you accept Jesus, you accept victory over sin in your life. That is at the core of the incarnation. That is why Jesus was here. Not just the gift of eternal life, as wonderful as that's going to be, and as much as we look forward to it, but victory now over sin. Now I'd like to turn forward, and there's a favorite text that I love to look at that helps me, because, you know, we are emotional beings, and we tend to... Um, we tend to relate to life and deal with things in emotional ways, right or wrong. You know, uh, the way we reason things through sometimes is irrational. It makes no sense. And we go through our bouts of depression. We go through our bouts of manic happiness sometimes, you know. But wherever we find ourselves, I love where this text brings us to, especially in times of trial. Hebrews 4, verses 14 and 15. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. So we're back to Christ in the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. And verse 15, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Now, let me put that in the positive for you. The, the author put it in the negative, but let me put it in the positive for you. For we do have a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses because he was in all points tempted as we are. The struggles that you go through in your own life that maybe only God knows, nobody else knows, Jesus understands. And we should not be hesitant and bringing those struggles to him. You know, um, sometimes God is presented in such a way so high and lofty and so disconnected from the human experience that sometimes we think our prayers are just, you know, being responded to by a God who's looking down going, no idea what you're going through. I, what are you saying? I, well, okay, whatever, you know. Sometimes we view God that way, but that is not our Jesus. Our Jesus knows what we're going through and understands intimately the cries of our burdened hearts. Paul, or the writer of Hebrews, goes on to say, verse 16, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. There's one more thing that I'd like to cover this morning, and it comes from the most famous chapter in all the Bible, John chapter 3, 
So if you turn there with me. John chapter 3. We've been talking about life in the Spirit and what that means, what the incarnation's meaning, real meaning is for our own experience in life. And really it comes down back to this story, which I find uh, pointed because here we have a religious leader, a man by the name of Nicodemus of the Pharisees, who is supposed to be able to teach and apply these things and, and share with people what it is to have a religious experience. But he was caught up in that whole Judaistic system that had all kinds of laws and things you had to do that really defined what religion was. So Jesus here is speaking an entirely different language than he's used to. And I think it's pointed for us because no matter where you are in your religious experience, it all comes down to this. It all comes down to being born again. So I'm just going to read through just the first oh, eight verses of this chapter. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night because he was afraid of being associated with somebody like him, such an odd teacher, and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus just cuts through it, all right, and gets to the point. Verse 3, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And this was completely baffling to Nicodemus. He, sa he answers in verse 4, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? So Nicodemus is thinking to himself, this guy is a little bit off his rocker. What application is he having here? How is he bringing birth up? I mean, I'm not going to turn into, turn into a baby again and be born again. But Jesus just keeps pressing forward. Most assuredly, verse 5, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirits. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the spirits. The birth of Jesus, as miraculous as it was, and as marvelous as it was in this world, only begins the journey for us. It only starts to open up so that we can have this experience with the Spirit that Jesus is talking about. I want you to consider your own life this morning. Have you been guided by the Spirit or the flesh? Where is your walk taking you to? Where is your walk taking you in the future? Where do you see yourself? with Jesus? Are you being guided by his spirits? Do you understand the sacrifice that he has made on your behalf? Do you understand the gifts he has for you, the spiritual gifts he has for you? All of this is the meaning behind Christmas. It's the meaning behind why we gather and worship. Not because we're any good, but because Jesus is are all in all.